good evening and uh, welcome to our Sunday service. And, and we're going to look tonight, uh, as we've seen in the newsletter, we're going to look at Psalm 8. And Psalm 8 uh, follows on from the services of Wednesday and this morning, um, looking at the glory of God. So let's just pray anyway before we start our service tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time of fellowship, be it on Zoom. And we thank you that uh, whenever we look at your word, you're able to speak to us and your spirit is help, helping us and guiding us as we do so. And we thank you that each time we look at your word, perhaps uh, we, we find something new. And tonight we would ask for your help, your spirit's help, both for, for me as I lead and for others as they listen or, or see this again on YouTube at another date. And we would ask for your help in understanding the scriptures and using them fruitfully in our lives for your honour and glory. Amen. So, as I said tonight, we will in a moment. And uh, it's, as I just alluded to in prayer, that we are following on really from this morning, uh, where we looked at uh, uh, th those words that we've been changed from glory to glory. And uh, this morning, um, we were in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and in the week we were in Hebrews. And in Hebrews, in, in the midweek, we did touch on the psalm we're going to talk about tonight, because it, fig it figures in, in Hebrews chapter 2. And the, the issue in the week was that um, humanity had lost its honour, glory uh, and uh, at the fall, and our Lord restored that through his work and we were looking at that subject in in the week but tonight we're going to turn to the psalm uh, and in that again we'll be looking at another theme if we wanted to put a heading on it tonight uh, god's excellent glory is how i would put it uh, tonight and um we we are i guess trying to look for God's glory in, in the scriptures, or I am, and this is a theme I'm pursuing at the moment, and we're looking for it uh, in him himself, we're looking at it in creation, also looking at glory as revealed in humanity, and we've already seen some of that, and it's astounding really that, that when, when we start to focus, we can, we can see so much uh, glory in our God, and his power is stupendous. The power we see in cre cre creation is stupendous. And we should see again uh, tonight uh, phrases like out of, out of the mouth of babes. How many times have we used that just in common parlance? And, and that comes from this psalm. Uh, and that, that's an expression which is remarkable. And we, we, we sort of nod to that in, in daily life, I guess, when we use that phrase ourselves. But, but it's such an important thing when we think about the way God uh, uses and displays his power. And also, this is why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says, God's strength was made perfect in his weakness. So, so again, it's through weakness that God uses his strength. Anyway, we'll uh, look at the psalm now. And if you'll join me in, in looking at Psalm 8, we'll read from the Holy Scriptures. So, Psalm 8 reads, and it's, it's entitled to the chief musician on an instrument of Gath. I wouldn't know what that instrument is myself, but it's a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And that's the text for tonight, uh, the, verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So, 
just again some thoughts about our God and the glory of God that come out out of this and 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 the excellent is the word I've picked up on tonight and and you know we're looking at the excellent glory of God as we thought this morning really glory um the weightiness of honor the the value is is all wrapped up in that phrase how much we value and and do it it again today glory can be i guess bangles and medals and football cups or whatever you're interested in it, it is how people term glory but the glory of our god using the scriptures both of this weightiness of honor the richness of, of our god uh, and that's what we'd look at I'm going to start, I guess we put some points in the newsletter and, and um, we will have three points and, and there'll be three points here tonight. And I'm going to look at the uniqueness of God, first of all, in, in these verses. And then we'll move on to the expressions of his glory and how he expresses his glory. And then come back to this crowned with glory and honour uh, phrase. And thinking of the writer of the Psalm, David, and and um, his life, you can see it wrapped up in this Psalm, can't you? That the, the way uh, the words and the content come out uh, in the Psalm. And just for a moment, I guess, think of the writer and how he's come to these thoughts uh, about God. Uh, and you can just imagine, can't you, David, the young shepherd boy, um, and that that was his obviously his background and he'd be up in the hills of Judea with the sheep, um, perhaps not far from the little town of Bethlehem, uh, and the, your dead sea to the south. So he's out under the stars, and I know some of you have been to that part of the world, uh, and we've been out in the night, and you've got the clear skies, the balmy night, and you can sit on a hillside. Um, I referred to it this morning when we were talking about stars. I know on one holiday we went out into the desert and we sat on a mountainside with some Berbers and and, and the, the clearness of the night and it, it comes out in the word, really, of what he's experiencing. So... Uh, that, that area of the world doesn't have the light pollution that we hear of today. Anybody who's interested in a telescope and stars will tell you it's very hard to find a dark place. And even the government nowadays are trying to create parts of the country where, where people can actually um, go out without light pollution and be able to actually, even with the naked eye, see the stars sometimes is difficult because of the glare of street lights and house lights and, and so on. And without the detriment of light then this young boy sat on the mountainside looking up at the heavens and and as he looks at the heavens he, he can make out as, as it were the the myriads of stars and he would wonder i guess at, at the, the the greatness of what he saw before him and and then relating that back to god and creation and um in, in thinking about these things uh, and, and the lights in the sky and pollution, um, I've come across something that is a Russian firm even trying to put up advertising up in the sky in the, so that uh, whether it, I don't know if they're going to do it by some sort of satellite and then, they, you know, whether we'll have Coca-Cola beamed a, around or something more Russian, I suppose. Uh, but but uh, how, how, what an awful thought that is really, isn't it? When when we want to look at God's creation up there in, in the sky. So here's David and he's beholding God's wonders in front of him and he comes into worship, doesn't he, as he, as he looks at the stars and, and he sees the wonder of what God has been put before him. And if we start looking at some of these words, um, and in verse 9, O Lord, and then note the possessive term, O Lord, our Lord. So again, the, the possession, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth. And David's meditating, no doubt, as he thinks about his life and he thinks about these, these situations and he looks at creation and he meditates on it. And, and we're encouraged to meditate, aren't we, on God and think about him. And, and I hope we do from time to time. When you see a lovely sunrise or a sunset, I, I, I guess we look at it and or we see a rainbow and, and, and we can but wonder at God's creation, um, where, especially in the skies, I guess, more than more than on the land. We look up and we say, look at all of that. Look at God's glory there in creation, literally sparkling, literally shining out, as we thought about this morning. And that then 
grasping, I, I guess, of the hugeness of God's creation and, and the weightiness then of who we are dealing with, who is God our Father, and you just sit there. Yeah, you, you, what a reality strikes home, I, I, I guess, as, as, as we come across it. Uh, and here's an interesting way to think about God's glory, and you can demonstrate it over and over, can't you, in God's word. What David is doing here is thinking about God and his uniqueness, I guess, and, and the excellence in that uniqueness in him, in his very sense, in his very essence, that this God of ours, our Lord, he says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name on earth. It draws him to this conclusion, doesn't it, that, uh, you know, how do you sum up God when you can see such wonders in the skies? Even his name is excellent, isn't it? We remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, his name is to be above all other names. And, and that's hard to grasp for us sometimes, isn't it? How is a name above all other names? But, but it just reinforces that there's nobody above our Lord. He is the name who should be revered and should be worshipped and should be worthy of our, of our praise. And when David looks up at the heavens he also looks around doesn't he what's around him in creation the rest of creation the beasts of the fields are around him and perhaps he considered you know a pond nearby where, where the sheep were watering or, or the sea you know of galilee or wherever and and we can see that coming out can we in the scriptures here as he thinks about creation david began to marvel over today i guess what we we would even call science wouldn't we today the marvel at the mar marvelousness of of the biology of the beasts and the fish and and the geography of of the area and the realization is he refers to it as the work of god's fingers you know and you come into how do we describe god what words do we use to describe the wonder of god and we can only use can we the terms that we would be familiar with so so when you, you'd use terms like the work of your fingers because our hands our hands are pretty remarkable um, when we think of all the things we can do with our hands and he he uses this phrase and the work of your fingers the work of god the uniqueness of what he's created nobody else has created heavens like these so he's unique isn't he and what about this word unique anyway let's deal with that um what things are unique and i'm sort of thinking of them you know and, and everest comes to mind mount everest it's it's known to everybody it's it's well known uh, most people around the world would re, would 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 have heard of it um it's known as being the highest mountain in the world it's unique it's the highest it's 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 the, the highest mountain in the world probably so high they can't even get an accurate measurement of it i guess although technology comes and goes if again if you uh, i know neil likes me googling but if you do google you can get different heights and by different numbers of feet depending on measurement you use it's the highest mountain in the world so does that make it unique um is it the tallest mountain in the world it isn't a quiz tonight but no it's not the tallest mountain in the world the tallest mountain actually is out in hawaii because it starts under the sea it comes up as an island and and, and it goes up i don't know how to pronounce it mauna kea uh, that's the tallest mountain in the world because it starts below the sea and it rises up so is it unique at mount everest is it the highest the tallest uh, what about depth shall we go there um the dead sea is regarded to be the lowest point on on the land in in earth but then is that the lowest point and because again again no quiz question but the marianos trench out there and and i think it's called challenger deep within the marianos trench that is regarded as the deepest part of the earth so deep seven miles deep something like that that you can go down uh to the deepest part. so does is that a unique thing i and thinking of these things the unique things we can come up with in our physical lives in a in our humanity then they also tend to be part of other things don't they? so everest is a is another mountain um mariana trench is another trench so it, it isn't particularly unique is it but let's turn that back why am i talking about all of this is i know it's very interesting um but it, it well you may find it totally uninteresting which is fine but 
I'm trying to point out that God is totally unique. There isn't another one like him. We hear people talk of gods and we know they're nothing more than idols, are they? Or, or, or philosophies or, or whatever. We, we worship the only true God, the unique God. And as we do so, that, that really should bring us to worship and glory in and of itself, in and of the person of God, his unique excellence. And when David says in, in the verses, you, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who, who have set your glory above the heavens. See how David is trying to get these ideas together of glory and excellence, and that's what's brought me to bring these together tonight. Now, it's one thing to say that his glory is unique, and there's only one like him. But we'll have a look at um, Isaiah 45 and verse 43, and, and it really bears a look at another scripture as well. But there's more to consider, I think, when we come to look at him. God is uniquely excellent, but what does it mean to glorify God? Because after all, God glorifies himself. So what exactly are we, we to do when we say gl we glorify God? Well, think of it in terms of his essence, first of all. We've, we've, we've been there. We've been dealing with his the, the uniqueness, if you like, of his essence, who he is, the very person he is. But then you can look at God in another way to, to, to look at this excellence. And it's expressed, I guess, in, in the way he expresses his glory. He exhibits his glory. So rather than himself, now, the way he exhibits it. Uh, in the things he does, in, in, in what he carries out uh, as we read about it in our scripture and as we experience ourselves. He's not only uniquely excellent, but he expresses excellence in his various ways. And in Psalm 8, in creation, uh, the word of God is expressed. And we talk about the glory of God in uniqueness in the very essence, but we need to come back, I think, and look at the where he expresses it in, in these. Now, if we notice in, in Isaiah 45, if you wanted to turn to it, um, verse five, the thought is there about his uniqueness and what is conveyed. And this is a section in Isaiah, and it starts way back, and uh, look at Richard, you're back in, in 40 verse one, and it, it goes for a number of chapters, and it starts off with, with uh, something you find in Handel's Messiah, comfort ye, comfort ye, my, my people. And we move through to these verses. And, and, and in 45.5, we read, I am the Lord, and there is no one else. There is no God beside me. God himself, making it clear, there is no other God other than him. There is no other God other than our God. And that that's if you like, is is an issue for some people. Um, he says, I am unique, I am the God, only God, this, this is the only God. But occasionally you will have people, as I mentioned, say, well, there is another God. And even, I, I guess, it's one of the errors I think um, I'm right in saying that the Jehovah's Witness uh, religion would, would say that Jesus Christ, he's a God, but he's not their God. In other words, we've, another God was created called Jesus Christ. Well, when we come to Isaiah 43.10, let's see what that says. And, and I can read that for you. And carefully consider what said to you when people are saying these things. And our God says in the word of God by Isaiah, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor there shall there be after me. God himself, in his word through Isaiah, confirmed quite clearly for us, for us that there is no other God to be created after him. He is the only God, and, and he is formed, um, in, and Christ is, is part of that Godhead. So, as we would all, I guess, hopefully agree on here, we see the Godhead as the Trinity, doesn't, don't we? Uh, all in one, the three in one, the Trinity of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And as we consider these things tonight, we are, we are considering the work of the Trinity, aren't we? And this will be an eternity, past, future, present, 
that no other God is formed. So anyone really bringing forward these ideas of another God, uh, they're dealing with arguing with the scripture of God himself, that, uh, that, that this is untrue, this is false teaching and should be cast away quite, quite, quite quickly, I guess. So this means then when we talk of the glory of God and his essence, secondly, in considering this expression of glory, uh, we, can, we can do a, a number of things, I think, and home in on it. And, and, and again, a silly, um, a silly uh, sort of analogy again. It's a bit like we're playing a bit of I Spy here. I I'm, I'm want us to home in and look for something tonight. And, and we're looking at the, at the uniqueness of God, the glory of God as seen in, in his expression and his exhibition. And even in this passage, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. What does this mean to talk about not only um, his excellence, but his exhibition? So turn into those earlier parts of the verses uh, and, and the ones I've quoted earlier. Uh, we read, out of the mouth and babes and nurses infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger reading that again out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies and you may silence the avenger moving into god and how he expresses and how he exhibits his greatness and his glory so as i mentioned as, as i introduced uh, our, our session tonight that uh, wh when we think about god who created the moon the sun threw stars into space and then we think, how would God silence his enemies? And, and we've got it here. How would God stun his enemies into silence? Um, the Avenger. Um, the, the, and, and if I were to put it into our hands, I, I guess, like the movies, we would um, expect God to use, I don't know, an earthquake, a volcano, thunder and lightning uh, to express his power. And we know in the scriptures, God can express his power in, the, in these ways, can't he? And what does our God decide to do? And, the, and, and we know from our scripture that he will use those weak things, those weak vessels, which, which any logical person would say, well, why would you use a baby? Why would you use... Um, weak vessels uh, to, to, to undertake your work. But in his uniqueness, our God, to, in his, set forth his glory, chooses his way of doing it, not what we think is the best way to do it. You know, and I guess at times we, we've even prayed, why don't you do this God in this particular way? And he surprises us. He does us something totally different. We're perhaps praying for totally the wrong thing because our God will amaze us and, and do the impossible and use the impossible. So here's the amazing thing here, isn't it? It's mentioned out to the mouths of babes, babies, sucklings, the marvellous way he shows his glory. He's ordained his strength because of his enemies that he may silence his enemy. And that draws us then to, to remember Jesus using these phrases in Matthew chapter 21. On the triumphal entry, um, as they were coming through the Eastern Gate, we read that the chief priest and the Pharisees, uh, they were saying to Jesus, um, do you not hear what the people are saying? Are you listening to them? And Jesus uses, uses the opportunity to quote these sort of words. And he said to, the, to those uh, people, have you not heard? Uh, have, you not, uh, have you not read that up to the mouths of babes, he has ordained strength? So to the chief priests and to the Pharisees and to the people who, who, who were there, he was saying, Unless you come to know the Lord like a little child, you are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you um, become weak, become humble, you are not going to really understand. While you are using your pride and knowledge of the scriptures and you think you've got it right and you expect a certain thing, you need to realize that God will use weak things and humble things and not proud people and... By humbling ourselves, we, can, we become his children. 
and we behold his glory, not by being proud and boastful and, uh, and so on. So speaking of his glory in little babes, God himself presents himself on earth, doesn't he, as a baby in, in that manger in Bethlehem as well. So again, an expression, God decides to exhibit his strength in a surprising way. He, he, he no doubt could have come to earth in a, in a different way, but he decided to enter this world as a baby, again, to a broken family background, as it were, to, 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 a, to a problematic situation, again, exhibiting that the God of glory can do a surprising thing and use the, the weakest of methods, which to him we will carry out the great and glorious things he can carry out. Again, even more interesting when you consider verse three and what the psalmist, uh, the, the once uh, shepherd boy looking out on the heavens he says when I consider your heavens when I consider your heavens pause in there have you considered the heavens and, and as I spoke earlier uh, perhaps we haven't got uh, a clear night tonight or whatever but but uh, you know when we had it week or two ago and we did have some lovely moons early in the evening even in the daylight you could see see the moon and we had this sort of eclipse which we couldn't really see in our part of the country um earlier last week and he says sure he said consider the work of of your fingers when i consider you, and and i come back to what we said earlier that you know how we how he uses communication to communicate to us is also amazing too our oh, god could blow our minds by talking about um the things of heaven he could blow our minds but he uses terms like fingers and hands to try and get us to understand how he works and how, how he um, is able to und undertake things you know when we try to read uh, the, the revelation that we and we hear of colors don't we and gemstones and and john there is trying to sort of somehow encapsulate the glory he's trying to see when when he's having this vision of god and he says you this is the work lord this is the work of your fingers the heavens your hand has put this into space and as as i said as crafty as we are with our hands we can play musical instruments or like william we can use the computer or if somebody else can cook or or whatever or write uh, things using we understand that is a tool we use to make things and he uses simple language for us and this is how good our god is he helps us explain and uh, you know as we do things like this and we talk and i try to explain what i'm going to get across to you i wish i was able to encapsulate things so simply as god does in his scriptures uh, when when he does it so you understand what the psalm is doing for us it's bringing us to an understanding of god's greatness um bringing it down to our level so we understand it but still uh, imparting infinite wisdom and he knows exactly how to communicate with human be beings and limited finite beings such as us. He knows exactly how to draw near us, to exhibit um, and express then uh, the greatness of his glory. It's about him and a marvel about him in the way he communicates. He communicates to us as a baby almost and through babies. And, uh, you know, to look down on that and say, oh, you know, it's poor. I think of Paul this morning, you know, and, and, and the criticism of his simple message. But Paul, for all perhaps his physical or, or philosophical faults, he, he was preaching Christ crucified. And that was sufficient. And this is what God does. He does what is right and sufficient as work and works. And as I said this morning, when we try to grasp the greatness of God and we think of verses like this, we know that the most powerful telescopes cannot count the stars. And yet his fingers put these into space. There are billions and trillions of stars which are yet to be discovered, I'm sure. And yet he can't put it into space. Um, I, I, most of you were either too old to have had a calculator or too young to have had a calculator these days. So people around my age will remember when you did certain calculations of the calculator, when they got too big, you ended up with an E, which meant I can't work it out anymore, the calculator says. So those of you who are trigonometry books, um, I'll leave you to think about that or abacus and the rest of you, you do it on a computer nowadays or your phone, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. So I'm sorry for that. But 
those of you about 60 should have used a calculator, uh, I would have thought. But that's what it does, doesn't it? When we try to grasp God's greatness, we overload. Um, it's beyond, if we're using a figure as an number, it's beyond the biggest figure we can calculate. It's beyond our words. But he has got this way of expressing his greatness that brings it down to this level. And David is trying to express that by what he knows as a simple boy sat on a mountain and, and wondering at, at the greatness. And then the psalmist, having considered all that greatness, David had considered all that greatness, what he then goes on to is probably the most obvious question that you would have not come to that is, what is man that you are mindful of him? Given how great you are, how huge you are, how, how, how fantastically unique you are, what is man that you are mindful of him? And that's wonderful from mankind's point of view because we know that, that we have benefited greatly because God is mindful of, of mankind. And when you consider the universe or you consider the, the seas or the mountains or whatever, what is man is that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him for you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Now, those of us who were there uh, on Wednesday evening, we, we looked at some of these verses, didn't we? Uh, when we were in Hebrews, and, and we realize here that th these verses are used in Hebrews to, to explain to us how our Lord Jesus Christ made himself a little lower than the angels to come to earth, to come to this world as a man, to, to come into mankind, as it were, a little lower than the angels for a while to carry out a task. And that task was, was to bring us to salvation. Uh, and this, these, where these words come from, and, and it's the same for humanity as also that humanity um, is is made a little lower than the angels. Um, but once we, we are up in heaven, we're told in Corinthians that we will be judging angels. So, so that's the leap we make when when we go on to heaven, and 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 that's what is in store for mankind. So what is man that God would be mindful of him to do this, to come and lower himself lower than the angels, to bring us back with him to crown, to be crowned with glory and honour? Uh, and, and David, as a psalmist there, is, is, is moving into considering this. What, why would God, and, and then when you move on from why, you move into praise, don't you? You move into what a wonderful way God is expressing his, his greatness and his glory to, to be prepared to lower himself, to be care, care for mankind. And those of us who are saved, we must on occasion say, well, of all the people in, in Porth, in the Rondha Kanantafa, wherever we are, why are we, what, is, what are we to be called into the church of God? And, and when you think of it in that, that sense, in, in all the world and then, in all of, of, of mankind, what a privilege it is then if we, we take that sort of a verse and, and translate or transpose it onto our, our lives. And who are we then? To, to experience the greatness of this God whose fingers form the heavens. Uh, and, and that is wonderful. And as I say, you know, as, as, as I'm going on this trip around the glory of God, you, you ask yourself that question, who are we to be part of that? So it brings us back to ourselves, doesn't it? Now we consider ourselves and, and, and where we were in Genesis 1 and, and, and speaking of God. A creation initially and he's speaking here of, of amazing greatness and power as he, as he does when we read in Genesis 1 about creation and there are those I guess we work with we, we meet day in day out who would say we're fools to, to think any of this is great because aren't we cells aren't we aren't we just I don't know um, on, on a journey from however many years and make the best of it, you know, spend all your money on going to watch a football in Italy because that's the best you're going to have in life or, or um, you know, get the best holiday you can when, when there's an amber or a, or a green light and you can get on an aeroplane. Is that all there is? And people will say, yes, that is all there is. We want to experience all these things. And, uh, 
I don't know why you're wasting an hour on a Sunday evening. Um, it could be two hours if I go on, uh, on a Sunday evening to think about the things of God. It's a waste of time, isn't it? Get out there and enjoy yourselves. Go out and, uh, and do things. And But our Bible says, no, his people have come and been redeemed and we've been crowned with glory and honour. And when we think of the greatness of God, to share and to become like Christ, as we thought this morning, to be an image bearer, to be made in his image, is, is such a great privilege. Uh, and it's certainly not meaningless. Life isn't you, you, you're born, you live, you die, and, and you make the best of it. You go to the Bible, like Psalm, Psalm 8, uh, here tonight, and what it says for you is you're crowned with glory and honour. And, and when we look at that, that should encourage us as well to be, say, show other people the scriptures and say, look, look, at, look at this, you know. But we know the reaction, don't we? As we said this morning, there is a veil in front of people and people just can't see what we seem to enjoy. Um, they just can't see it. And it is a, good, a work of God's spirit to, to, to enable that to happen. As C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, those who deny there is meaning are like fish out of water denying there could be such a thing as water. And that, that I thought sort of sums up again when we sit with, with people who are non-believers and, and people who cast away God in the scriptures, um, they are really just missing out on the water, the very water they need to breathe, as it were, the very air they need to breathe. Humanity knows deep down inside that there's a meaning in life and they search for it. And as I said this morning, we are tremendously privileged as God by his spirit has given us the understanding to get this meaning into our lives. And um, again, you know, we're picking up on something Ronald Reagan wrote on his autobiography, I think it was the title or whatever, he said, he said, where's the rest of me? And this is, this is what people feel like, don't they? And, and, and you, you do try to explain the scriptures and bring the scriptures to people who just can't see this greatness. And, 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 and for some, we must just keep bringing it to them. When we think of mankind and being created and and being crowned with glory uh david is reflecting on the words i think back in genesis 1 and if we go to genesis 1 chapter chapter one, sorry genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 to 31 I got so used to seeing two Corinthians or whatever this morning. I was expecting two Genesis then. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. And I got it up on my screen ready for me to read. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of, of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So... I want you to think in really keep thinking about this psalm and God's excellence is exhibited particularly in the heavens exhibited through humanity and and in in doing so you know the the world um, passes many laws got many policies and so on uh, and you know it moves on with no relation to God nowadays. And, and you know, we, we moan, I guess, as a, as a country over the fact that our country t seems to move away from recognising God as creator. You know, education is more and more coming that way, that uh, we teach science more than we teach um, Christianity. But 
uh, but scripture is still you we use it and scripture tells us that every child is made in the image of god we each are made in the image of god and that's a fantastic fact that we want to resist i guess the world knocking out of us making us conform overly to science is the answer and and 60 million years ago a piece of mud turned into something and then turned in, 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 into us the nation thinks, as I see it at the moment, our nation thinks that it can just dump God. Uh, it thinks that God is irrelevant. The modern world doesn't need God. We've got computers. We've got artificial intelligence. What is God? Where, where is God? And, and I guess my warning would be to, to, to the world that says that is, you know, the fact that God is silent at the second doesn't mean silent. God is, isn't in existence and, and has gone away. God is, is able, as we've heard already tonight, to make his own mind up what he's going to do and what way he's going to do it. And as we've seen in, in the Bible and in history, he can do it in a surprising, in a quiet way, in a weak way. And anybody who thinks uh, that the church is dead or God is dead is in for an awful shock, aren't they? as we look at our scriptures and we read our scriptures. And I, I, I can say really that it's fascinating that we, we can see the world move in that way. But God continues to exhibit his glory in his people. He's crowned us with honour and glory. And that's no matter what scientific breakthroughs are made, we always know God created mankind and, and the very hands which might be very clever in science they were made uh, by God himself and, and they've only got their skills because of what God created in the first place you know there's a there's a story of a, of, of a man who has read this psalm he was ill uh, a geographer an oceanographer uh, and he's the man who mapped the flows of all the oceans because as he read and he was he was taken up by the verses here that mentioned there are paths of the seas that pass through the paths of the seas, it says in verse 8. And that just inspired him to find out about God's glorious paths in the seas. And, and, and he is, he's very much uh, held up as a great uh, scientist but it was the word of God that inspired him in the first place. And God had, 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 had inspired him. And he was in search of what God had done and to see what God had done that inspired that great oceanographer. And, and wouldn't it be great if scientists re recognised that more often, that it was they're inspired by God uh, and they, they, they're they able then to go and research his glorious world that he's created. So... In, in danger of going on too long here so how are we going to use this message and apply it uh, I think is a question and uh, I think we can apply it to our hearts in a personal way very much as David has done so in his psalm oh lord our lord how excellent is your name in all the earth is what he says you know he's put his wondrous glories on display in the heavens he, he's it should result in us worshipping him in, in very much the way David chooses to, by acknowledging the greatness of him uh, and to, to enjoy the fellowship we, we have and we're privileged to have with God. Uh, we can see the wonders in humanity and even praise in humanity his excellence because, as they say, the greatest scientist uh, we're given these abilities and this biology through through the work of, of our God. And anybody who says God isn't near us, uh, we know the scriptures tell us that's not true um, because he is very much alongside us. We don't have to ask God to come to us. He's with us all the time. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And it's, again, as a, as a, just a last aside, I, I guess, as we look, as we look, thinking of being image bearers, and just thinking of, um, I, I'm not sure if it's Anne or somebody close to me the other day said, I don't like going into Cardiff anymore, because if I go in in the evening, I have to see the homeless people on the streets. Um, I have to see that. Um, and we also then perhaps, I've heard somebody else say, Oh, I, don't, I hope, you know, because I'm leaving work, they 
people have been moving. I hope I don't work with so and so. They're really obnoxious. I really would like working with you. So that was nice, wasn't it? Uh, see, I'm not as bad as people make out. So they're all made in God's image. Also, they're always image. They're all image bearers. Um, the kids on the Washington building steps. Um, the the ones who annoy you with kicking the football over your wall or, or wherever. All of humanity are made in the image of God. And, and that we should wonder at as well. And that sh we should should uh, hope result in them being crowned with the honour and glory that we, we realise. So in closing, uh, I'd ask us to consider and behold his glory. Um, as in we, we read in 2 Corinthians uh, this morning, but we all with unveil, unveiled face, beholding in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same Im image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, hopefully that is each of our view, that we've got this unveiled face, we can see the glory of God, and he's changing us from glory to glory. Uh, and the one who's doing it, doing it is unique, he's uniquely excellent. And he expresses his excellence in such wondrous ways, in such weak ways, but such hugely powerful ways, to his honour and glory. So, amen to that.